We're looking at the first, uh, well, verse 3, actually. And uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Just so much there um, to, to look at. So what I wanted to do today was just start off with a video. Um, basically, just to let you know that this is available to you, number one, uh, it's a different form of teaching. Uh, I hope it's going to work because I just noticed I have a symbol here that says our internet is not there, but uh, let me press play here and we'll see it. It worked earlier, so... three through five now of first Peter and spend several sessions on these verses because they are so dense with important things like uh, God's great mercy and the new birth and what it means to say that God is blessed. So Father as we just dip now into the first verse of this unit explode in our hearts like Peter seemed to explode with this word blessed be God I pray that our hearts would say blessed be God because of what we see here I ask this in Jesus name Amen blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to his great mercy he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then what follows is surely the reason why Peter responds like this. These are realities that produce in Peter this kind of response. This is, this is worship. This is praise. When you say, blessed be God. It's, it's, I remember going fishing on the piers in Daytona Beach or Myrtle Beach or uh, St. Petersburg. Florida with my dad as a child and I remember We'll give it a chance here, but if it doesn't work, uh, we'll try something different. <laughs> What is that site? This is called Look at the Book. And uh, you can actually get this on YouTube. And it looks like it's not, uh, it's not going to work. Apparently our internet is not very good down here. It says not connected, although it doesn't work. Let me see if I can maybe reconnect. To it. Disconnect first and then we'll try it again. There's no internet there. It's not picking up on any at all. Okay, well, I'll, I'll see what I can do next week. I actually wanted to download this, but this is actually on YouTube and uh, YouTube doesn't really give you the option to download unless you pay for a subscription, and I don't do that. But uh, it is called Look at the Book. Let me just cross that out that way if that does come available. Um, you can get this from um, John Piper's website, Desiring God, and it's Look at the Book. And then you'll have the whole list here of the different lessons. If you uh, 
um, find it on YouTube and you can't, or if you can't find it on YouTube, let me know and I can give you a link. But it gives you every lesson and it's called Look at the Book. And it, it usually they're, I would say most of them are probably 10 to 15 minutes long. And for the most part, it's just him reading the text, circling things, underlining things, taking you to other texts um, so, that, so that he can maybe reinforce what is actually being said uh, within the text. But this one here was good. I'll see if there's a way I can get it next week. And uh, if we can, we'll, we'll do it. But uh, I have... Uh, a lot of other things here, and I didn't really, um, I didn't really include some of what he said. So, uh, but we'll, we'll work through what we have and then go from there. So, again, we already read it, so there's there, there's no need to read it really again. But just what I have highlighted there is just some major points that really, from this text, uh, which Peter's right, remember to the Alexa, elect exiles. And um, he, he just starts off here with, with blessed. And, and it's just a form of, of praise, okay? If, if, you're, if you was following along with this morning's um, scripture reading, you actually had in there, blessed be the name of the Lord. Um, so you would actually see that. This is used uh, a number of times. Uh, he says in the video, if he counted right, uh, it's used uh, around 27 times in the Old Testament where it says, Blessed be the Lord. Um, and and I, have, I have one or two here that I wanted to, uh, to just show you that it is a form of praise. It, it is a form of uh, worship uh, that, that, that you could use or that you would use. So this comes from 1 Chronicles 29 verse 10. Therefore, David blessed the Lord, all caps, so it's Yahweh, before all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. So, and the reason I chose this text is because in the video, he, he brings out um, that, that Jesus called God his Father. Um, and, I, and I don't want to take away from that, but yet that is a common way that the, the Jewish people refer to God as being their father as well. But in Jesus' case, they, they knew exactly what he was implying, that he was making himself equal with God. Although in the Old Testament, people said that God was their father in no way did they mean that they were equal with God. But yet, they understood Jesus to say that. So that's the difference. But, but here's a text here where he says, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness. And you can just hear the praise here in this, okay? Yours is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory. And the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you. And you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. So, this was just one of the many that I found. Um, and, and the reason I think John, or John Piper says, I think 27, if I counted right, he says that in the video. Uh, because there are times where it will say, blessed, blessed is um, God, blessed is the Lord, so it depends on how you're going to look at each phrase, but it is a form of praise um, for our purpose here, and, and I can totally understand Peter starting out that way, because of everything that he lists coming down, remember he's writing to people here that were um, at, at 
the very least, was separated from Israel, separated from uh, Judea. They were in Asia. Remember, we looked at the map in the top part. Um, but, but he's writing them to encourage them because of the per per persecution. But with that list and everything that comes later, you can just get the sense here that, that he's opening up um, with, with that same, with that phrase. Paul does the same thing in uh, Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and, and he, almost the exact same, it might even be the same, but and Paul often does that. There's just an opening of, of praise. So, if, if you've never had opportunity to, to have an amplified Bible, um, it was one of the ones that, I, I had a small New Testament, and I don't even remember how, how I got it, and, and I've since given it away. I brought it to Reapers along with some other books, and, and it was snatched up um, just as quick as, be, quick as could be. Um, but the Amplified Bible, I, I, I really like it, and only as a companion, though, uh, because a, a lot of times I, I like how it comes alongside, I like it with the truth that it brings out, but yet it, it in some ways can maybe lead you in a misconception. Okay, so, but I think they are spot on with, with what's wrote here. So the, the Amplified Bible says, blessed, and then it puts it in quotes. And, and so what they're saying is this is actually what blessed means. Okay? Gratefully praised and adored. So again, just to bring out here that Peter is just praising God. Uh, so blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy... His abundant, and then they add in boundless mercy. So um, that abundant can mean just rich beyond measure. Has caused us to be born again. That is, and then here's where they bring in the doctrine. Um, and this is where, like I said, as a companion it's good, because this is something that you need to test. But in, in this here, uh, they're, they're spot on. That is, what it means to be born again, that is to be reborn from above. Spiritually transformed, renewed, and set apart for His purpose. To an ever-living hope and a confident assurance through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, again, it's just the same passage, but I, I like it whenever they would put in the quotes... Uh, like any time they talked about grace, it would always have a quote, um, uh, undeserved. Um, grace is undeserved, and it would, it would have it right there um, next to it. So if you ever get a chance, or you can maybe get it on the internet um, just to read, I, it, like I said, it was just helpful to me. So the idea of being born again, okay? And um, we, we've looked at this before from John chapter 3. And actually, I don't like born again from that text. Because in John chapter 3, he uses born, which is the word, but it's anothen. It means from above. Okay? And so, in all honesty, in John chapter 3, it should always say born from above. It should not say born from again. I understand why they do what they do. Um, but, and even in this case, the word here can mean up, okay? So, this word, anogeneo, right here, it comes from two words. The first word is ana, okay? Ana. And it means from up or again, it in, which intensifies this word, geno, okay? So, it's two words put together. And geno means to give birth or begat, okay? Properly born again or born from one hog. So it can, it can mean both because this word again actually can mean again. But when you look at how it's translated and, and how it's used, it, it has a very broad meaning to it. But for our purpose, this word altogether... It would be 313 in Strong's concordance. 
uh, or Strong's um, lexicon. It means born again or from above. It is only used two places in the scripture in the Greek. Only two, and only Peter uses it. Uh, both times it's referred to God regenerating a believer, giving a supernatural new birth. So, uh, again, I understand why they say born again, because it is something that we are born anew. And it means spiritually we're given birth. Um, I like it better being born from above because that's exactly what he's saying here. He said that God caused us to be born again. Um, that word geno or geneo is used, um, if you start out, I think it's in Matthew and I think in Luke, where it says Joseph begot and so and so begot and begot and begot. That's the exact word. And that's also the word that's used in John, uh, John chapter 3, where it talks about being born, um, born spiritually, is what Jesus is talking about with Nicodemus. So, just to give you a couple other examples, this is the only other time that that word is used. Okay, so the first time, he says, God caused us to be born. In 1 uh, Peter 1.23, this is the only other place that word is used. Having been anagoneta, born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So, if he was going to break this down... We've been born again through the Word of God, which lives, abides forever, and it is not corruptible seed, but it's incorruptible seed. So, again, that's why it's so important that we um, use Scripture when we are speaking with people, because it is the Scripture. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Um, so... Again, you can tell your story, and, and I'm not saying that God's not going to move on that, but according to Scripture, it, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Um, and, and some people really take this to a very weird place, saying that you have to quote Scripture exact, it's got to be word for word, and, and, and I don't, I'm not going to go there because I don't believe that. But I, I do think there's power in the Word of God, and, and it says the Word of God doesn't, re, it doesn't return void. So, but Peter really brings it out here again. He's praising God that um, in, in my text, the New King James, it says that we are, he has born us again. But if you look in, in other literal translations, meaning ESV, NASB, it's he caused us to be born again. And, and I think that's probably the truest sense of the word. That was what was in the Amplified as well. So, thinking on being uh, born again by the living and abiding Word of God, uh, these are two places here that you really, honestly, I don't, I've never heard anybody explain this or teach this, okay? Because this really goes against, probably, I, I would never say this, okay? So we'll look at First 1 Corinthians 4.15. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ... Yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. This is Paul saying this. Okay? I have begotten you. That is geneto. That is the word that means to, to, to be born. Okay? Or beget. Same meaning here in Philemon. I appeal to you for my son... Look at the term there, my son. Up here he said you have many fathers, okay? 10,000 instructors, yet you only have, you have many fathers, okay? For in Christ Jesus. But here he's using the word my son, whom I have begotten while in my chains, okay? So, and, and this is something that I would never say, but yet Paul uses it here. And, and Paul is saying that he begot, or that it was through the gospel, 
And I'm sure in Philemon that he was sharing the gospel with Onesimus. That's what the whole letter is about, Onesimus. Um, and that's why he's writing to Philemon. But he says, I've begotten. So what Paul means here is I have presented the gospel to you. And then through the living and abiding word of God, the spirit has moved and you have been reborn. You have been spiritually made alive, um, brought from, from the dead. So, just to show you Paul's theology, here is 1 Corinthians 3, 5-8. through 8. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believe? So you believed through them, but as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, I, Paul, planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who is waters, but it's God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So again, we'll, we'll be rewarded for our labors in this life, our actions in this life, but Ultimately, it's God that gives the increase. It's the Spirit that moves. It's the Spirit that causes us, or it's God the Father that caused us to be born again, to have our eyes open, to have our ears uh, open, to have our hearts changed from stone into that heart of flesh. So, and what, what John Piper does in the look at the book, in, in in that particular section, I feel is really powerful because what, what he is saying, that God causes us to be born again, and it's not something that we did first. It's something that God does first on us. He's the one that causes us to be born again. Um, and, and we can look at those verses but, like I said, I'll try to get that next week so that, we can, uh, so that we can go through. I just think it's really good. And like I said, I wanted you to see that that's available because, to me, it's just so powerful. I like to see someone work through the Scripture. Um, I don't mind having people stand up and talk, but honestly, I, I'm more, I learn by seeing. So, for me, it's really helpful to see them go through the Word. And here's the last place, uh, I mean, you could spend many sessions on the idea of spiritual regeneration. Um, but, but for our case today, we're just looking at it from this point, God causes it. So, but, but here's another place where we have that word, ganeo, um, which means born. Okay, so 1 John, and remember now, John, most of the time when you talk about being born again, most of those references come from John. Either the Gospel of John or 1st and 2nd, 3rd John is, is where the majority, especially 1st John, 1st John just has it all through it. Okay, so this is the major theme that, that John really, in his writings, really brings out. He says, little children, uh, here again, what's that word implied? Okay? It's, it's children of God, offspring of God. We get that from, from John because he, he talks about how the Sadducees and Pharisees, how Jesus called them offspring, had a brood of vipers, offspring of Satan. He said, Satan is your father, but God is our father. So, children. He says, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Christ, okay, is righteous. Verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Okay, so again, I'm just reflecting back on what I just said. If you're of the devil, that's going to be your actions. You're going to have a practice of sinning. If you're of God, if you're born of God, a child of God, then you will be practicing righteousness. It says, for the devil has been sinning from the, big, from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to, to destroy the works of the devil. And then no one 
geneto, born of, of God, makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides with him. Remember, we just read about how it's, it's not a corruptible seed, it's an incorruptible seed. You're born again through the living and abiding part of God. So this could be a reference to the Holy Spirit as being the seed. I think in the New King James, I think they capitalize seed right there. Um, but the reason I chose the ESV is because in the, in the New King James, they'll just say, whoever... Uh, I, I don't like how they, they, they don't... It's an ongoing repetition in, as far as practicing righteousness or practicing sinning. It's an ongoing, it's not a once and done, but it's a lifestyle, okay? So, and that's what he's saying here, and I don't think the New King James really brings that out the, the way that the ESV or the NASB uh, brings it out. So, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning. You hear how that's definite. If you're born of God, it's, it's impossible. You cannot continue to sin because God's seed abides in him. And, then, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been geneto of God. He's been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God. So again, we're not necessarily to judge others, but yet we are to look at the fruit. Okay? And here's one of those texts. This is evident who are the children of God and who are children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And then, and then John moves into this idea of love and God is love and we have to love our brothers and, and all of that. So uh, John is the, the, the writer that a lot of they call him the writer of love um, towards fellow man, but yet he, he really has some hard hitting here, okay? So he gives us, it's evident, it's clear, it's distinguishable who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. And it's going to be always according to their actions. So, born of God. God caused us to be born again. To what? Uh, he continues on. To a living hope. Living hope. So, and again, if we're thinking of being born, if we're born, we're now living, and we have now a living hope. Okay? As opposed to um, a dead hope, if you will. Um, there are people that... Uh, I've met people that don't believe that they're going to answer for their consequences, but yet that they think that, you know, um, somebody's always up there looking down on us, you know? Oh, I hope they're in a better place. Well, if they didn't know Christ, and if they didn't live their life according to His Word, chances are they're not going to know a better place. They're going to be in a place of torment according to Jesus' words. Uh, so... A uh, living hope, though. This is one of the phrases that comes to me to, to really explain that it's a living hope, okay? Paul writes to the Corinthians church and says, If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. So, Peter is saying that you have a living hope, and it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know how important that is. Paul here tells us if Jesus Christ is not raised from the dead, everything that you are basing your life on, everything that I'm basing my life on, everything that we talk about here in church is useless. Because we are blaspheming God if He did not raise Jesus Christ from the dead. Okay, so, and that's where Paul is going with here. He says, yes, and we are found false witnesses. Okay, you hear that? Because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up, if that's the case, that's what Paul's saying, if in fact the dead do not rise. So again, you've heard Pastor Tyler make the 
um, the, the somewhat of a joke. Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were so sad, you see. Okay? Well, I first learned that from John MacArthur a long time ago, and he made it a joke too, but it really sticks with you. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Okay, so they was totally against this thought. Now the Pharisees, they actually did believe in the resurrection, so um, for them, they were just against Christ being the Messiah. But, Paul here says, For if indeed the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, our faith is futile. You are still in your sins. In fact, you're even in more sins because you blasphemed God because you said He raised Christ and He didn't. Verse 18, Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who have died in hope of Christ, in faith in Christ, have perished eternally. They're damned. Because they put all their eggs in one basket. They put all their hope and their faith in Jesus Christ. And they fell asleep. They died. There's no second chance. That's very clear through Scripture. There's no purgatory. You're not going to atone for your sins. None of that nonsense. Verse 19. And this was really powerful for me when, when, when John Piper spoke on this. Because um, we, we just don't think of this. If in this life only we have hope in Christ... We are of all men most pitiable. And, and John Piper brought out about how, how this man confessed that Jesus was um, Christ and somebody came to him. He, he lived his entire life in obedience to him. He lived his entire life in obedience to the Word of God. And, and this interviewer came and he says, What if, on the day that you die, what if you then realize that... Um, that, that Jesus, that, that all this is just nonsense. And, he, and his words was, well then I've still been blessed because I've lived my life in this way and this is the best way to live. But look at what Paul says. He says, we are of all men most pitiable. And think about Paul's life. Think about the early church here, what they suffered. Loss of homes, loss of family, children denying them, parents denying them, loss of possessions, loss of rights, loss of privilege. Look at what Paul suffered numerous times, being by rods, stone, um, shipwrecked. I mean, his whole list that he goes through. He said, if, if Christ did not die, if he's not risen, then we are of all men, all men, most pitiable. And that's because following Christ, it should be, it goes along exactly what, what Scripture says. In this life you'll have many tribulations. It'll cost you something to follow Christ. And, and because it costs us something, then we are of all men most pitiable. So, the living hope, then, to me, it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that was exactly what Peter was saying. It's all through that resurrection. If Christ is not raised, then we don't have that living hope. So, he moves on to 1 Peter 1, verse 4, and, and this here's the living hope that we have an inheritance, that it's incorruptible. It's undefiled and does not fade away. So three terms. Incorruptible, undefiled, doesn't fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you, for believers, for children of God, for people that God caused to be born again, who are kept by the power of God. That's a powerful statement kept by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So we'll take a look at those next week. As I said, I'll try to get the, uh, the video going. I'll see if I can download that. That way we don't have to deal with, uh, with the internet being here. But think on it this week. Think of why Peter would use those words, incorruptible, undefiled, 
and it does not fade away. So for me, when, when he says he caused us to be born, I know that we're born into the family of God, and when you talk about having an inheritance, how would an inheritance in this life how would that become incorruptible? Or how would it be corruptible? Because I think that's what Peter's doing. I think, he's, I think he's going the opposite of what things in this life do. So our inheritance becomes corrupted. It becomes defiled. And in some ways, it can even fade away. So if you can, think about that, and then think of the flip side, because Peter here is saying that anybody that is born of God is, uh, stands as an heir. We're children of God, so therefore we inherit these things from God, and then just powerful. Um, it's not even here. It's in heaven. It's reserved. It's set apart for you. You who are being kept kept by the power of God. So here again, we have the doctrine of the pers perseverance of the saints. God keeps you. The idea that um, no one can snatch them out of my hand. So we'll look at that uh, in more depth next week. But again, if you just read through this, I know for me, it, it's, it comes to my mind a lot now just because we're uh, working through it. But um, as I heard John MacArthur teach on it years ago, it's just such a powerful section of Scripture where you just have all these things that God has done for you. And like, like I said in the sermon, John McCarthy, the but, 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 no, this is all for you. And, and there's no denying it. So um, it, it's a, a helpful thing for us, maybe in times of depression, maybe this would be a good section of Scripture to turn to or possibly even to memorize if, if that's something that you find yourself able to do and able to recall. I often can get the phrases. I can't do the word for word very well. So let's go ahead and close here with a word of prayer and we'll pick it up there next week. Again, Father, we're grateful. Uh, according to this scripture, according that you have caused us to be born again, that you have revealed, Father, this living hope and that living hope is always through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Knowing, even further back, that, that our sinfulness was placed upon Him. Our transgressions was placed upon Him. And His righteousness now has been placed upon us. So we have an inheritance because of that. Because we are now your children, we are born in this inheritance, Father, that, that is kept for us, reserved in heaven, and, and we're not left to ourselves, that you even guard us. You keep us and sustain us, at least until uh, our last breath. And then we can step into that glorified body, and we can finally be uh, the people that you have ultimately called us to be uh, within your presence. So, Father, again, we thank you for this grace, this undeserved favor, and uh, the abundant mercy that you have shown to each one of us. Mercy, Lord, every day. Um, because we're getting something we don't, we don't richly deserve, but yet that rich abundance um, and the mercy that you have given us is just phenomenal. So we thank you, Father, for that. Bless us as we go from here, Lord. Cause us to dwell upon your word, to meditate on it, and to realize our position in and through Jesus Christ. And we give you all praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.